Thank you. Funnily enough, it's my favourite chapter in the Bible. It's um, John chapter 17. You can find it on page 1085. 1085. Verse 20, I'm heading Jesus prays for all believers. <coughs> My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have, been, you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you know in, in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, <clears throat> I got the order wrong, so we're going to have the intercessions that uh, Chris is going to come and lead. Um, morning. It's hard starting off. That's my worst thing. Um, okay, so we're talking about prayers. Um, Jesus prays for all believers. So what I'm going to do is just a little context before I dive straight into the, uh, the gospel. And I'm always thinking it's quite a good idea just to put things where we're going and where's the, the background to the story. And then we'll talk about really getting into what Jesus is saying and what is, it, what is he's prompting us to do. So we're talking about so the Gospel of, of John, and John is quite different than the other Gospels, and he's, very, he's had plenty of time to think about this. Um, the other Gospels were done fairly shortly after um, Jesus um, ascended to heaven, whereas John had some time to think about it. So it wasn't necessarily quick, it wasn't quickly just written down. So there's quite a lot of reflection there. And you know, John was an eyewitness to the Lord Jesus. He was one of the disciples. And um, Jesus taught him, and John observed and watched. And you can sort of get an emphasis of that if you go through all the Gospels of what is actually John doing. So one of the things that John emphasizes and tries to pick up on is Jesus' inner life and his identity. The other Gospels tend to focus on what Jesus said and did, which are, which are very important. But John is a slightly different emphasis. Chapters 13 to 17 in John basically gives quite a large account of what happened in the upper room. And that was at the time of the Passover meal. 
And a lot of people will be familiar about what, what took place there. It was when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He talks about how he, Jesus, is going to die. He predicts um, Peter's denial. He talks about how Jesus is going to die and go away, but that he's going to come back. There's quite a lengthy kind of um, talk on the Holy Spirit, that he is not going to leave the disciples and indeed us sort of on our own, but the Holy Spirit is going to be a big part of the future church. And he also said the disciples would be um, persecuted. And these are very sort of deep and intense conversations. And they are extremely heavy teaching. I mean, if we might want to place ourselves at that upper room at the Passover meal. And you can kind of pick some of that all through the Gospels. They were confused. They were worried. They were a bit upset. I'm not sure they had a lot of peace then. Uh, we've been talking about a lot of peace at Letton Hall. Um, did they have peace? I just have a little question mark about that. So it's in this context that Jesus prays, and this is the longest recording prayer he does, um, what we was recorded in the Gospels. And he effectively breaks it down into three chunks. One, he prays for himself, and basically what's going to happen in the next sort of three, three days and beyond. So he asks Father's help that he'd be able to do what his mission on earth was. He then turns his prayers to the disciples, which is effectively the future church. And he knew that they would have a really tough time <clears throat> when he died. They would be scattered. And so Jesus has a heart for those disciples during that time of, you know, of upset and chaos in some ways. And then he prays for us, all believers. And that's really the focus of today's sermon. So that's where we're kind of going. Okay, I'm going to start off with verse 20. I'm just going to read some of the scripture out. Um, there are notes, and um, I know home groups are going to get all this, all the transcripts, and I'm sure other people get them as well. So my own means make notes. But there's loads of sort of scripture references throughout this, which I'm not going to read them all out. Okay, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. So this is what Jesus is praying. My prayer is not for them alone, my disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So Jesus is praying for you and me, even though we might be 2,000 years in the future at this moment in time. Now, Jesus has a lot of confidence in his disciples. He's praying for them, and he's praying that they would spread the gospel. And he's praying that we would believe as a result of their ministry and their teaching. And because of those 12 disciples, we are here because we've listened to their word. We read their, we've read and are reading their written word. So we are here because those disciples were obedient to their calling and their commissioning and because of the power of the Holy Spirit, they created other disciples in Christ. Okay, verse 20, 21. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Is really quite complicated and deep, some of this stuff. Um, I'm going to go through sort of the two requests. Jesus makes two requests in that passage. And the first one is that, verse 21, that all of them may be one. He's talking about the body of Christ here. He's talking about all of us, every Christian that's ever been born and lived from 2,000 years ago to now, he is saying that he request that all of us may be one. Just as he goes on to say, just as you are in me and I am in you. He's saying just as Jesus is in God. He's talking about his relationship. I shall unpack that in a bit more detail in a minute. 
his second request, and he repeats this again in verse 22. Um, so this request is repeated twice. That's how important he thinks it is, this idea of unity, this being in one with one another. So this model of unity, this unity that Jesus had in mind, is that of himself and his Father. At the center of Jesus' identity is his relationship with his Father, his heavenly Father. And that is a relationship of such intimacy that he can say that anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. That's John 14, 9. Such is that complete union that Jesus has with his Father. It means that Jesus' words have their source in Father God. Again, John 14, 10. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. <coughs> Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing the work. Jesus is expected to be saying that that relationship, that unity, that union he has with, him, with his Father is paramount. And Jesus can do those things that he does because of that relationship, that unity that he has in his, with his Father. The model of unity that we, are, we, that we are to follow is that of a relationship between Jesus and Father God. The second request, 20, verse 21, is, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. So Jesus is in union, and unity with his Father. He is calling us to be in unity with them. So we're not kind of like isolated as individual Christians. We are there to come form part of that unity that Jesus has with his Father. Now, how is, this relate, how is this obtainable? How are we to have unity with our Heavenly Father? If we take unity seriously as a body of Christ, then we need to, as individuals and as a church, and as a church leadership, we need to take our relationship with Jesus seriously. When we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus models behavior that he desires his disciples and all believers to follow. In John 14, 12, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. In fact, he will do even greater things than these. Now, Jesus spent time with his father, and he would steal himself away the crowd and his busy ministry and draw strength by being in union with the Father. I think that being in unity with one another and with the Lord Jesus is only possible when we have that, uni that unity, that union with Jesus. I do not think unity as a church is particularly possible outside our relationship with the Father. And I think in some ways we can think about being in unity with one another is really difficult. And I think it is difficult. And I think that's why we need to be in unity, union with Jesus. That's why about spending time like Jesus did with his father actually spills out in terms of our own relationship with one another. Okay, John 17, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. This is what Jesus is calling us to do. As he is, with, as he is one with his Father, he is inviting us to be one with him. Now this is a journey and a process. And it's something that we learn and pick up as we walk in step. Jesus. It's not kind of a magic thing that sort of happens overnight. This is about ongoing relationship. And I've, and I've told you this before. Every time I stand up here, 
I keep on coming back always to one thing about that relationship that we have with Jesus. You know, every sermon I think I've ever delivered at Christ Church, I keep on coming back to this. Things happen when we're in union with Jesus Christ, when we spend time with him. Jesus is spending time with his father. He felt that that was really important. In fact, he's saying it was so important, he probably couldn't have done the things necessarily that, that he did otherwise. He's saying the father was in Jesus. and It's, it's the father that worked through him, enabling him to do those things. He's calling us to be in union with him. And it will be the father working through us as we learn to walk in step with him. Now, this sort of union with Jesus is not just open to a select few. It is available to every single one of us in this church. It's not just for what we might call spiritual people. And we might all have kind of labels and think, I think that that person's spiritual. It must be just for them. Well, Jesus is not about that. It's about it's available to all. In fact, he wants it. He wants us all to kind of pick that up and be in union with him. All it takes is for us to respond to the call and prompting of the Holy Spirit to spend time building and deepening our relationship with Jesus. And the question I just want to kind of pose is, do you feel that prompting? Are you aware of the Holy Spirit prompting you to go in deeper in your relationship with him? Because I think it's within that kind of relationship in John 10. Well, John 10 becomes a reality. It is the Father living in me who is doing his work. The Father loves us, and he, we are his hands and his feet on earth. And if we spend time with our Father, our Heavenly Father, as we get to know him, as he equips us, as he fills us with the Spirit, we are able, we're able then to say it's the Father working through us who are doing those things. Now, I'm sure there's people in this room who listen to a bit of classic FM, and I really like that kind of stuff. And at Easter, they do the Hall of Fame. Um, they put down the, they basically, we all, people can vote on their three favorite songs. I don't know if anyone else did that. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And over the Easter holiday, uh, Easter weekend, they do a kind of top of the pops of the classical world. And I'm not, you know, it's basically like four days of classical music. I'm not able to catch it all, but I tend to look through the list afterwards. And there's actually quite a lot of Christian songs there. And there's a great one on number 288, which I hadn't come across before. And in that, it's a really beautiful piece of music that says, Christ has no body now but yours. And um, it's, I'm not familiar with David Ogden. It was written by him. But I did a bit of research yesterday, and it, it's actually words written by St. Teresa of, of Avila. Avila, yeah, Avila. And, you know, saying, Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. And, you know, when I first listened to that music, I was thinking, do I believe that? You can, you can over-spiritualize things when you're a Christian. Of course, Jesus walking around and stuff. I do recommend that you listen to that. It's, um, it's, Christ has no body now but yours. But in a way, Jesus works through us. The good things that we do here and in our relationships with one another and our work colleagues is effectively the Holy Spirit doing that work within us. We are Jesus' hands. That's why we kind of pray for healing over people. Yes, we're drawing on the Holy Spirit. But it's us who is praying for people. We are effectively his hands. We are the vessels in which Jesus, the Father God, is working through. And that's why our relationship with, um, with Jesus is absolutely important. If we really want unity, which I want to come back to, we need to be in unity with Jesus. 
Now, my home group are really mean to me, and uh, they're, uh, you can't, they look angelic. Uh, it's, it's a falsehood, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> You know, then these secretly, they've got a little card in front of them. They're going to say, we're going to play um, Song of Songs, bingo. <laughs> I've, been all, I've not mentioned this at all yet. Uh, it's a great uh, perseverance. I haven't quoted anything yet. Um, all of that, which I really love that passage. I'm not going to quote script, but it's about that relationship. It is a calling of us to go deeper. And I passionately really believe in that. Are we taking our relationship seriously? Are we taking it seriously? I think people are. I think there are people in here who genuinely believe and are doing their, you know, we're working hard to spend time with Jesus. There are huge benefits when we do that. It is great. It is nice to be used by our Father. He loves us. He wants, he wants to work through us. He wants to bless us, and he wants to bless. I'm absolutely sure of this. He wants us to bless those people around us, our work colleagues, our families, the people we may bump into on the street. We are his hands and his feet. So why is unity so important? John 17, 21 so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 23, to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. How else are those people around us going to know that God loves them? How is that going to be possible? Now, I think the Holy Spirit can do what he wants, and I think he can... Absolutely, he can stir people up, he can wake them up in all sorts of ways. But it's also what we are doing as well. Those hands, those feet. How else is Luton going to know? It's this you know, Love Luton campaign. I think that is so important. I love that it's called that. It's probably not a Christian organization, but it's great. But we should be doing that. We need to love Luton, love the people of Luton. How else are they going to know that they are loved by God? Unity is very important. Christian unity enables the world to see and to understand that Jesus is divine and is God himself. After all, I'm just quoting someone here. After all, one of the greatest miracles known to mankind is when Christians get along. Some people call that a miracle. That's really sad, isn't it? It's absolutely tragic. I think Newton has actually got quite a lot going for it in terms of in this department, actually. Um, some of you have been Christians a lot longer. I've been here 16 years, quite a long time. And I think there's been a lot of good things where churches are working together. Um, I just loved the Good Friday Walk of Witness last Easter, Good Friday. I haven't been to one of those for a while. See, I'm not perfect on this. I don't do all these kind of stuff. Uh, But there was loads of people there from different denominations, different churches. That's what unity is. When Christ's body in Luton comes together and does this great act of witness, and what I also particularly liked was each church or denomination had a little role to play. So it wasn't just kind of St. Mary's putting on the show. There were lots of churches doing participating, whether they were doing prayers or scriptures or singing or doing a little role play. I thought that was amazing. I think that was a really good act of witness of the church being in unity. There's this thing called, which I haven't been to for a very long time, and I look at, no, I, I repent of that, the Transform Luton Prayer Initiative. There are groups of people in town who pray each month. And that, again, is a cross-denominational thing. And they pray for the needs of the town. I think the street pastors, again, that cuts across all sorts of kind of churches. Again, an act of unity. What's important? Jesus. That's what's important. 
to these groups. When I came here, um, actually it was about 16 years ago, there was, um, actually it was 15 years ago, it was just 10 came to Luton, um, J. John. Again, how amazing was that? I'd only been a Christian about a year when that happened. And J. John, I think, I don't know the background of it, but I think one of the criteria for him coming was that the, ch the, the Luton churches would come together and put on that event. So it wasn't an Anglican event or a Baptist event. It was like a, a it was Luton being the body of Christ. And lots of people went to that. It was incredible. God spoke to me massively through those events, as I'm sure he did for many, many other people. Pentecost praise. I mean, there are loads of these things. This is, I'd call this good practice. I'm sure the Lord Jesus is thrilled about stuff like that. I think he's enabled this to happen. But I just wonder where churches and denominations come together. I'd like to think the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus is going to do something even special at those events because it's so rare in some, in some instances when the churches come together. And there's a little challenge here, and I'm saying this to myself as well. You know, perhaps we as Christ Church just may need to it'd be good for us to participate more in some of these cross Luton events, to be a body of Christ in Luton. Yeah. Mm. So church matters, matters, it really matters. It's not just simply coming to a club, a club to join. There are churches like that. We are a body of Christ, and each one of us is part of it. That's Corinthians 12. Indeed, our fellow church members are our body. This could be in this building, but also the church members of Luton. Like it or not, we are as closely connected to specific people in our congregation as we are in Jesus. We are part of his body. We are as tightly bound together as our hand is to our arm. And it might, we might want to think about this. You know, do we feel that? Many of us are happy to become relatively close to a handful of people like us, but to others, less socially able, less perhaps intelligent, less wealthy. There's loads of criteria we can put here that we effectively say get lost to. You know, I think I do this, and I repent of that. Yet everyone in this church and in the church in Luton Jesus was happy to be united to in himself. And if we don't kind of do that with one another, then we're kind of saying to different parts of Jesus' body, as actually that's not, that's not good enough for me. That's the part of his body I don't really like. Again, I come at, there's some loads of notes in my, in my handouts. I've stolen some of this. It's like, imagine Jesus walking into our room. Would we dare look at him and say, Jesus, great to meet you at last but I don't like your ears and your nose is pretty hideous that is effectively what we do when we subtly cut off people in our congregation who we do not instantly take to if Jesus welcomes them then so should we after all we and I have no right to be rescued and saved any more than anyone else When we, as his church, are united, we are beautiful. We are the bride of Christ. When we're in disunity, we're going to be un we're unattractive, to say the least. Perhaps we're the ugly sister. There's a quote here, and I, when I first read this, I was quite shocked. But perhaps we already know it in our hearts. Um, Thomas Manton, I'm not familiar with him, he said something like, divisions in the church breed atheism in the world. That's such a horrific statement. Divisions in the church breed atheism. It's obvious, isn't it? If we're not getting on with one another, why would you want to join, <laughs> come to this church or Christ's church 
in Luton. It is the unity that we are is the unity that we're experiencing impacting upon our community. Can we say to our neighbours, my co-workers, my family, my friends, we can say this for each one of us, that we are in one, that, that, that we are one with our church. We need to be able to say that. I think we're getting there. <laughs> okay, all this sounds, I've nearly finished, all this sounds really difficult, this thing called unity in the church. The concept of unity doesn't mean that we have to be perfect. That just isn't going to happen this side of heaven. I've got a lot of work that needs to be doing in me, <laughs> and so do you guys. <laughs> um, instead, we are called to be mature to be mature about it. Ephesians 4.3 says um, that we need to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The key word is preserve. The good news is it is, the, it is God the Father with Jesus and the Holy Spirit that creates unity. That's their job, this thing. They've already done it, unity. They have unity together. They are one. It is our job to preserve what's already been created. In fact, the phrase, one of the Living Bible, talks about the idea of being perfected. And perfective means kind of growing, in, sorry, growing into it. And this is why I think this walk in step with Jesus is about. They've already created unity. It exists. We need to grow into that as Christ Church and as the Church of Luton and the Church United Kingdom and the global church, the body of Christ. And we can only do that when we walk in step with the Lord Jesus. Okay, some practical things. Again, I've stolen this, so I, um, I'm, someone else will get the credit for it. We could do some practical prayers. And in fact, the um, chap I got this from said these are gifts we could pray for each other. In fact, we, it, this could be our prayer individually, we, and I'll probably pray this in a minute. This is how we can kind of start to grow into and perhaps perfect this unity. And we do that by, number one, we focus on what unites rather than rather than what divides us. And that's as a church of Christ Church, but also perhaps a church of Luton. So focus on what unites rather than what divides. Actually, we agree on far more than we disagree. And it would be helpful for us to identify those areas that we have in common. Number two, I find this one difficult. I would agree to disagree. I would agree to disagree until the Lord shows me that I'm right. Actually, I've, we've all got friends, actually, who we just, I mean, they are really, really good friends, but I just don't agree with them. And so many things I've got, in people like Neon Carroll, who are immense friends of mine, I, you know, they are so gracious. And um, I think I'm high maintenance as a friend to them, to be honest. Um, given the things I often say, um, you know, so many different ways in politics and all sorts of stuff. But our friendship is really more important, and we put those things aside. And I think we, sometimes we need to do that with each other as well. And if we agree to disagree, then we can pray about them, can't we, and say, look, this is the issue I have, or why don't we then pray for the Holy Spirit to give, give us and them wisdom. And the final one is, I will validate, not vilify. And when thinking about individuals whom we disagree with, think about some of the positive things that I can say about them. It's kind of being very proactive here. I think our gut instincts, my gut instinct sometimes, is to kind of be the negative side. It's very easy to kind of pick up on the things I disagree with. It takes a bit more effort sometimes, especially with some people, to 
think of the positive, but it's worth sort of investing in that. There are always positive things that we can say about other believers. It's about building people up in love. Right, that is a very heavy sermon. <laughs> um, I'm just going to do. I'm just going to pray now. Um, there are some notes, <laughs> which you might want to kind of read through, and go back to that scripture. I think that's the hardest thing I've ever preached on. To be honest, I'm just going to pray. Let's just invite the Lord Jesus in. Lord, we praise you that you have created unity. Thank goodness for that, (laughs) that we don't have to create it. That is your job. We praise you. We praise you for that unity that we have have in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We give thanks that you are that role model. We praise you that Jesus models behavior in the gospel. We pray that you help us, Lord, to to learn from you. And as you stole yourself away to spend time with your heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to do that with you. Again, I pray, Lord, for that hunger and thirst in this church, for this town of Luton, for this church of the United Kingdom to hunger and thirst for you. May we never be satisfied with our relationship, but want to go deeper. Lord, these things are impossible without your help from the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. We thank you for sending your counselor. Jesus said he went, he ascended so that we could have the Holy Spirit. We praise you for that Holy Spirit that comes and helps us. So we pray, help us to hunger and thirst. There's a great song I heard from New Wine, it's, and I'm not going to get it wrong now. It's a crater of fire within my soul that I cannot contain and cannot control. I pray that for this church and the church of Luton. Help us to be open to your spirit. Pray that we all have that prompting, that longing to go deeper. And Lord, we pray for unity in this church and Church of Luton and this nation, Lord. Help us to grow into something that you've already created. praise you and give you thanks.